So hello, thank you for coming. And I want to talk today about the library that I am, I'm writing in Julia called shirlab.jl. And what this library do is uh, perform the shirlet transform. That is a multidimensional generalization of the wavelet transform. But, but for everybody to understand this, I want to do a historic historical motivation on how the Shirley transform uh, came up and why it's important to have a fast implementation in uh, high performance language like Julia. So uh, the presentation you can f and, and the notebooks that I'm using today, you can find it in the shirlab.jl github uh, page. And yeah, let's start. So first of all, I want to have a definition of what is a signal or what we will understand as a signal. And for us, an informal but mathematical definition of a signal is a function or something that can be represented as a function that contains information about the behavior or attributes of uh, some phenomenon. In that sense, not every function is a signal. For example, uh, white noise that has no information about nothing is not a is not understood as a signal. It can be digital, discrete, you can see here, or it can be continuous or analog, also known as analog. So, uh, as we said, signal has information about something, and relevant information in very structured data is sparse because uh, the elements will be high correlated. Okay? The only thing that we need is uh, we need to know the right representation system or also called dictionary to have a sparse representation of your data. And that is a big task in signal processing because then you can optimally represent data and compress, for example. So as I said, the goal is find the right dictionary to represent optimally the data. For example, in this case, you have a blue vector and an optimal dictionary for a blue vector will be a sparse, uh, it will be a dictionary of the different shades of a color. Therefore, the coefficients that we represent blue will be really not much. So almost all of them will be zero, yeah. Along the history, there has been different attempts to, uh, to have representation system that sparsely represent data. And the first known, very well known attempt was a Fourier transform. It was proposed by Joseph Fourier, a French mathematician and in the 18th century. And he realized that some kind of functions can be well represented as a sum of cosine functions. Um, as you can see here, if you have a function, the Fourier transform gives you the amount uh, of, of energy that you have in each frequency of the function. Therefore, therefore, very periodic functions are well represented by cosine and sines, but of course, complex, more complex functions will not be well represented. And uh, Julia has a fast Fourier transform implementation, which is really easy to use. So for example, we have this function that is just a sum of uh, sine and a square cosine with different uh, frequencies. And to perform the fast Fourier transform, you just need to uh, use the function FFT, which is very, actually very fast, as you can see here. And the plot of this function of its Fourier transform is this, and you can see almost all of the coefficients, almost all of the frequencies have zero energy. Therefore, this function can be optimally represented by the Fourier system. Okay. And you can use just uh, the inverse Fourier transform function, that is AFFT, and you get back your data. Now, Fourier transform, as I said, does not optimally represent all data, mostly data that has a lot of different variety of frequencies. And you also lose time information about your data. So you integrate over a whole time, a whole space. So you will not know, you will know this, the frequencies, but you will not know when the frequencies are happening. And this will be a thing that you will need in some applications like voice recognition, for example. So the obvious way to tackle this problem is to give a, a spatial or a temporal information of the Fourier transform, and that can be performed by taking a small 
Windows function, and you perform the Fourier transform in this window that is locally, and you move it uh, over the whole space, and then with that you can again recover your data, but you also have temporal or spatial information about the frequencies. This is called the short time Fourier transform. It was proposed by a German mathematician called uh, Dennis Gabor in 1946. And it can be visualized like that. So you have a, a discrete data, you perform in small uh, windows that you move along the time, you fully transform, and then you can, uh, you can get your data again back. The problem with this system is that the size of the windows does not change. So you don't have like, you have just, you can just extract features that have a certain size. So you don't have very localized information about your data, and very localized information includes, for example, singularities, or uh, uh, uniformity. Uh, so how smooth is your data? You can also recover it by having very uh, well localized information. So again, tackle to tackle this problem. So the last time we tackled a problem of non-locality by take uh, small windows. Now we tackle problem, problem of not very localized information by changing the size of the window, different sizes. So you can also get features of different sizes. This is called uh, scaling. And this, uh, the proposition of this uh, solution was made by Morland and Grossman in 1984 and is what is well known now as a wavelet transform. So the wavelet transform is sure, short time Fourier transform, but you also change the scale of your windows. This can be represented by something called the convolution, transform, uh, the convolution operator. And so you have a convolution with a, with a windows function, and the windows function you change the size by applying the scaling operator. Uh, both operations, that is the scaling and convolution, uh, is easy to discretize. It's a straight, uh, there is a straightforward way to discretize it. And uh, convolution is, is uh, in the discrete case, is represented as filtering. And scaling is represented as something called subsampling. Okay? So this is one of the, good, the, of the very important features of the well transform, that you have a straightforward one, uh, fast discretization of it. And that's also the reason that it got a lot of success in, for example, is, is the transform used for the JPEG uh, 2000 image compression codec. And you can see it like this. The short time free transform is the same as the well transform, just that you change the sizes. Uh, in the shitlab.jl uh, library, I included uh, a small, very simple two-dimensional uh, implementation of the wavelet transform. So as I said, the wavelet transform is, is translated into discrete case by filtering. With, there is a lot of different filters that are well known in signal processing. I'm using, in this case, some filter is called the Debussy. And it's actually the filter that is used in JPEG 2000. And for example, I have uh, an image. I have this image of Barbara. And uh, I just need to do subsampling and filtering several times until some scale, which will be the uh, coarsest scale that we're working on. So the problem here is the scaling is isotropic. So you don't have uh, directional sensibility because your, your uh, windows is changing in the same, is scaling in both directions, X and Y, in the same amount. So you can just, in the two time, uh, in the two dimensional case, you just have sensibility of features that are horizontal, that are vertical, or that are uh, diagonal, which gives you a lot of uh, problems when you want to actually represent natural images that have curves, more, more complex curves. So as you can see, here's here are the, the coefficients in different scales, and you can see that represent different features in the image that of different sizes and different directions. And just zooming again up everything, 
you get reconstruction. Of course, it depends on how many scales you use, how good is the reconstruction. So you can see like with five scales, it gets quite pixeled, but with eight scales, it's very good. And uh, you can also, as you have different coefficients, you can also just take the most important coefficients in the sense are the bigger coefficients that have, uh, uh, that have the most interesting or most uh, common features in your image. And therefore, you can compress the image just deleting. The others are not so important. Generally, are the ones that have uh, higher frequencies in some cases. And in this case, I'm using a thresholding. So I delete some of the coefficients on the one threshold, and the reconstruction is still good. And we do, you have a signal to noise radio of 25 decibels, which is quite good. Now, as I said, the problem is that the transform is, uh, the scaling is isotropic, so you don't have any directional sensibility. Um, to have a framework of comparison with other transforms, we need to uh, do an abstraction of what is a natural image. And in mathematics, a natural image is represented for something called a cartoon-like functions. The cartoon-like functions are, are just functions that are piecewise uh, smooth, that have also boundaries of those pieces are smooth. Okay, so now we're talking just not, not in general signal processing, we're talking about image processing. Uh, these are, these can uh, be seen as, as this uh, blob. And uh, Donahoe, mathematician, he, in 2001, he got the best optimal representation that can be, that can be performed uh, by systems that are called frames. Uh, in, in the space of cartoon-like functions, so in the space of uh, natural images. And the best optimal, best end-term approximation can be uh, interpreted as how fast your coefficients decay. So the faster is the better, therefore you can take less coefficients and even get a good reconstruction. And the optimal uh, decay is n, to the, uh, is n to the minus one. The wavelet transform just perform until n to the minus one half which is not so good. And the problem here, as I said, is you have isotropic, uh, isotropic windows. So isotropic windows, let's say rectangles, does not uh, approximate good uh, curves. Therefore, we need to, to have a way to elongate our windows and change the orientation of them. And that's what shirlets do. So we need to, we need to introduce two new operations, which is parabolic scaling, that is a scaling that uh, uh, instead of having the same as amount of scale in the two directions, x and y, you have in one direction more scale than in another one. And the shearing, that is like cutting your, your, uh, your window. You, can, you use shearing to change the orientations of the windows, but uh, one can ask, like, why don't we use rotation instead? But rotation has the problem that when you're working with discrete spaces, it does not uh, maintain, it does not, uh, it's not, the, the grid, the discrete grid, is not invariant on the, uh, on the rotations. So that's a problem for implementation. So we will use shearing. This transform was uh, proposed by Gita Kutiniok from the Technical University of Berlin, that is the the chief of, of the group that I'm working, the applied function analysis, and by uh, Labate and Guo, who work in the University of Houston, Texas, in 2005. And it's actually a work of 10 years. So what they do is, is the same idea as the Weibull transform, but now you do parabolic scaling and you do shearing. So the most direct implementation have the uh, the tiling in the in the Fourier domain as it looks here in this in this image. So you can see that you, to 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 represent a curve that is oriented in the x direction in the Fourier domain, you will need to do an infinite number of shearings, which is a problem, of course. So what we do is we uh, divide the domain, the Fourier domain, in cones, 
and we implement f the Shirley transform in each coin, in each cone independently. The good thing about these, these transforms is that uh, one coefficient does not depend on the other one, so you can do a parallel, f uh, parallel implementation of this quite straightforwardly. So there is two ways to have your, your generating functions. You can have your generating function that needs to be two-dimensional. You can uh, just do the tensor product of two one-dimensional generating functions that can be taken as a wavelet. Or you can do also the tensor product and then uh, use a directional filter to give a wedge form of, of the windows. And this is the best because you don't have a lot of overlap uh, of the supports of the windows. So the, the tiling of the Fourier domain will be more optimal. So that's why what I did for the, the case of the Shirlet implementation in Julia. And the best enter approximation, so the decay of the coefficients, is actually kind of the same as the, mo the optimal proposed by Donohoe. So, uh, it is uh, an improved version of the wavelets, let's say. So that's why it is, it is important to implement it in, in Julia. There is different implementations already in MATLAB. It's the most common language. And the group where I'm working is uh, they implemented the Shirlab 3D. That is the most common used now. And it's actually very good implemented, so it's quite fast, even it's in MATLAB. Uh, there is a Python version of this library. And there is the Julia version of this library that I did. Uh, the best, the fastest implementation so far is the Julia implementation. And why? Why I use Julia? Because uh, in the Julia transform, you use extensive, you have extensive use of fast Fourier transform that is well implemented in Julia. In Julia, you can do a vectorization of the operations, and you also have uh, optimal loops. The, uh, as well as JIT compilation. And you have also plenty of image filtering, import, and rescaling functions with the libraries image.jl and waylips.jl. I use image.jl to, to for the rescaling uh, images functions and wavelets just to have a lot of different filterings. You, ha you also have a support of multi-threading and painless GPU acceleration with ArrayFire. So I also use ArrayFire to accelerate the library. OK, I will just show you as fast as I can how this works. So as I say, you use a scaling and a shearing operation. The shearing operation, you just need to be careful to have the invariant, the, the grid, the discrete, discrete grid that you're using. And this is performed by upsampling the, the signals that, are you, that you're shearing. So, I will use the same, the same uh, image to have a comparison. So I will use here uh, four scales, so four different sizes of windows. In the wavelet transform, the in the, mo the moment that was the best, uh, the first good uh, reconstruction was when we use eight scales. So here, using four scales is good enough, actually. Okay, so I have three important functions. There is called one is get shirlet system. What it does is you you use filters as a generating functions as a as a Windows functions, and you just scale and shear until they scale four. And uh, okay. It also have the same function for but using array fire, and it's actually faster. It's way faster. So in this case, it has uh, it, it took nine seconds to to get the shielded system without using array fire, and it took uh, two seconds using array fire. And the windows look like this. The windows at different scales at different shear levels look like this. So you can see that. The windows are oriented in different directions and also have different sizes, which is the idea. And this is uh, the last windows that is the low pass filter, which covers the low frequency part of the domain. In the wavelet, you use the same thing because you need to do an infinite number of scales to cover the whole domain. 
So th the best to do is just take low fi uh, a filter that covers the whole low frequency part of the space, and then you just need to do a finite number of scales to cover the other part. OK, so to, to get the coefficients associated to this, to this uh, image with our system, we use just the, qu the function shear deck, which means shear decoding. And it takes, it's quite fast. It also has the, the option of using a ray fire that takes 10 times less. And as you can see, like in the case of the wavelet coefficients, it looks like is the picture just, you just take the features at different uh, sizes and different directions of the picture. So you can see how the directions are changing. For example, here. Now you just need to zoom again everything up to recover. So this is performed by a function called shear rec, shear recovery. And the reconstruction is quite good. So here we use just four scales. And the reconstruction is even better than when, you, when we use eight scales in the wavelet transform. So benchmarks, maybe the numbers don't say a lot, but I compare in my computer, which is a, uh, it's a MacBook Pro that has eight gigabytes of memory, 2.5 gigahertz of Intel Core i5 processor, and a graphic card Intel Iris, uh, which is not so good. Um, and the performance against the, the MATLAB version is quite improved. So you can see here how MATLAB version until some point of size of the image. Here is the resolution of the image that we're taking. Of course, the generations, uh, the time that it takes to generate the system depends on the size of your, of your image. So bigger the size, you need more, more uh, elements. So at some point, MATLAB just gets not so scalable. Julia looks scalable and using GPU, so using array fire, it looks in this case like a constant. So the most, uh, in the three cases of the system generation, the system, the composition, and the recovery is the same case. And the most uh, amazing part is when, when I try to do a reconstruction of uh, image that is 2000, uh, 1024 times 1024, it talks 127 uh, times, is 127 times better than the MATLAB uh, implementation. So that's quite impressive, actually. Now, applications of the Shirley transform, for example, if you have a noisy image, the noise uh, represents uh, really high frequencies. So in a case of a natural image, these frequencies will not be covered by the important features. So if you do the Schiele transform, uh, the coefficients that have the less size will be the coefficients related to the noise. So if you just delete them, you denoise the image. And I'm using here a uh, Gaussian noise. So, uh, so you have here the noisy image and you want to denoise it and just eliminating the coefficients that are not so important, you actually get a good denoise of the image and the signal to noise radio is 23, which is quite decent. And I think the most interesting implementation, the most interesting application is the image in painting. So I don't know if you heard about in painting. In painting is, let's say that you have uh, an image that has parts that are lost, and you want to recover the lost parts, which sounds a little bit impossible, right? But the lost parts can be seen an, as holes in the image. So you can see, uh, for example, this case, you have uh, squares in the image that are lost, and you want to recover them. These squares are uh, high discontinuities, so uh, these represent uh, are represented by high frequencies therefore against taking the Schiele transform and eliminating deleting uh, using the using uh, iterative method that is called the trace hard trace holding iterative hard trace holding you can uh, recover the lost parts and 
This takes quite a while, so I'm, I already run it, so I, I will not run it here. And um, for example, you have a random uh, mask, so you have uh, random lost parts, and using the iterative thresholding, using the shielded coefficients, you get uh, actually a good recover, recovery of the image. And for example, here is a little bit easier problem because it's periodic, and therefore the recovery is better. So for example, you have images. Uh, this is a well-known application for seismic data because if you have uh, data that you are just uh, measuring sparsely, you can see this data as a, the original data but with holes of the parts that you didn't measure. Therefore, you can impaint this part and you get the whole picture. Uh, this is the, the current application that I'm using. So there is a theory called light field recovery uh, that you can taking a number of pictures of the same scene, a static scene, you can recover the depth map. So therefore you can do a 3D, uh, 3D approximation of the scene. Uh, but to actually recover a good depth map, you need a lot of pictures. So it takes quite a lot to do it. So if you just take a few pictures, you can see it as, uh, as a sparse uh, sample, uh, sparse sample uh, uh, light field, and you can do uh, in painting with Shirley transform, and you recover the whole picture. So, using wavelet transform, I use wavelet transform to recover this image, and you can see it's not so good, but with the Shirley transform, gets better and actually improves. Uh, other methods of light field recovery. And light field recovery is used, for example, in virtual reality applications. So yeah, that's, that's all that I wanted to say. And if you have any questions, you can ask it now. Thank you.